Hey YouTube, it's Pastor Dwayne here. So today we have Dr. Mark Ward with us and we are going to be taking a look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. Are we saved or are we being saved? Uh, Mark, why don't you go ahead and say hello to everybody. Hey everybody, it's really great to chat with you again and an honor to be on your channel, Dwayne. I've been following what you've been doing with this new nice edition of the Greek New Testament and I will definitely be putting my money in to have one. It's a really neat work great, that you're doing. Thank you very much. All right. So now if I, I would, I did a little search online. Actually, I didn't really have to do much of a search. You just see them all over the Facebook, but I've got a meme here. Let me pull it up on my screen. Uh, and this is the, uh, <laughs> the, the grid with all the, 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 um, the Bible translations, the KJV on the top and then the NKJV and NIV and so on and so forth. And uh, it's got 1 Corinthians 1.18, and it reads, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, I'm a big fan of the New King James Version, and oftentimes it comes, uh, I guess, under attack. I guess you could say that, um, because it doesn't say which are saved, and it translates this passage um, as uh, to us who are being saved. And so the meme is kind of trying to suggest that the NKJV is heretical here because it suggests that salvation uh, is a process and, and you're not just necessarily, you know, saved once you put your faith and trust in the Lord and turn from your sin, but it's a, it's a process of being saved and making it into heaven. Uh, so what, what are your initial thoughts on something like that? Yeah, you and I have both done some homework and preparation for this. And when you shared with me some of the tools that you were using to look into this. Um, I was, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say as well. But my first thought is kind of the 30,000 foot viewpoint. And maybe I've got two big 30,000 foot view things. One is, it, is there an orthodox way to interpret this from an evangelical perspective? Um, that is, isn't it true that our salvation is not yet complete? That is, I'm waiting for my sin to be entirely eradicated. I am looking forward and hope to that day. I'm waiting for my body to be mm -hmm. glorified. So there are future aspects to our salvation. I want to be saved more and more from my sin and from the effects of the fall. That's a big 30,000 right. foot view. And the second big 30,000 foot viewpoint I want to make, you know, when I, when I see these memes about the horrific you know, denying of Christ's deity and uh, messing with the Trinity and removing verses from God's word. I'm thinking, have our King James only brothers looked at the list of people who translated the version that they're mm -hmm. criticizing, in this case, the New King James? Have they read any of the books or commentaries, listened to any of the sermons, you know, preached by these very much evangelical and conservative right. men? Now, the New King James, you know, was translated 40 plus years ago, but how likely is it that a bunch of evangelicals, you know, mostly mm -hmm. Baptists, were going around monkeying with things on purpose to try to, you know, introduce false doctrine? And then the last, well, here's an additional, like, sub-point of that. Is there any other evidence? Like, why did they leave so many passages in that are clearly giving Christ deity, clearly teaching the virgin birth? if that was their secret plot. You know, there is there is no way to secretly change the Bible when there are so many Bible study resources out there. There is a conspiracy theory out there in King James defense of people trying to find malevolent, malicious, <laughs> malicious <laughs> intent where there is none. Yeah, so that's, that's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, one of the things that I often think about, and uh, I mean, I, I don't put all King James Version only is under this category, but um, there's a tendency to to dissuade other Bible translations um, based on what I would call, and I, I've said this phrase once before, actually, I think you were on the channel uh, when I said this, but I call it the worst possible interpretation. Um, so that is to compare right. a passage from the King James uh, with another passage uh, that's slightly different, but then give the one that's not the King James the worst possible uh, interpretation that you could ever come up with. And right. and I think we do have a little bit of that here. Um, so first, first Corinthians 118, when we look at those who are saved versus those who are being saved, we do have that sense in which our salvation is instant, um, but yet it's also a work in progress, right? So, so we're like you pointed out earlier, right. we're, we're not in heaven yet. 
uh, we're, we're still struggling with sin. We, we, we had a disconnect issue just now, which nobody's going to see because, <laughs> you know, the magic of editing. Um, but I came this close to saying a cuss word. <laughs> so, um, but, but that, that, that's the point is like, we're, we're still prone to that sort of thing until we reach heaven. Then, then there's a sense in which, which our salvation is complete. Um, so I, I don't know of any um, evangelical reformed or whatever you would have it uh, uh, believers who would be against that idea there. And I think whether it's our being saved versus are saved, um, I, I don't think I see such a large theological issue between the two. The Textual Confidence mm-hmm. Collective, you know, we talked a lot about uh, just weights in our recent series, which as of this recording, mm-hmm. we're still waiting to put out one more video. Right. Uh, you know, making sure that we're using a just balance. And I've often thought, okay, well, if if I wanted to swing that sword back, toward our King James defending, defending mm-hmm. brothers. My mind goes to um, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Timothy 1, Romans 1. You know what? I'm forgetting exactly what passage. This is terrible. I think it's Romans 1, where Paul says, no, 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 1 Corinthians 6, abusers of themselves with right. mankind. Like, I could say, that is so unclear. You know, the modern versions are very clear mm-hmm. in their condemnation of homosexual yeah. acts and desires. Actually, in sure. Romans 1, it talks about not just acts, but desires. And and yet, what in the world does abusers of themselves with mankind mean? That is very opaque. Right. Uh, that could mean all kinds of sure, different sure. things. And, and, and actually, it has to people. I have some evidence that people have misunderstood it in the ways I would predict. Does that mean that the King James translators, because King James, you know, I could make up this big conspiracy theory in which King James himself, of course, there are these persistent rumors that he himself was homosexual. Uh, Tim Berg has mm-hmm. talked about this in careful detail and said it's really just inconclusive, sure. which is what I would expect, yeah. you know, given such a private thing and during that day. But I could make up this conspiracy theory in which King James, you know, altered this in order to protect himself. That's just foolishness. That's that's not charitable reading. It's not accurate. Yeah, um, That's... That's the kind of that's the kind of malicious, <clears throat> um, unjust weight that I think is applied to the the new. King right James. now, the, the other thing that's often uh, uh, thrown out there in regards to this passage um, is we hear that it's uh, it's part of the critical text. You know, it's it's, it's a critical text translation. Um, at which point I, I go like critical text translation because we we don't often think of the critical text as a translation, right? Uh, we think of it as as right. you know the source of the translation. Um, but when we look at the textual tradition, uh, we find that the Greek word underlying here is it so many so so many. See why you say that? Um, it, it's um, it, it's. It's attested pretty much throughout the manuscript tradition, like all, all the major print editions of the Greek New Testament contain the same word. So it's 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 not a matter of it being a Westcott and Hort text or or a Nestle Allen text or anything, right. it, or even a TR text for that matter. Um, that it they're all the same here. Um, so the question is more of a translation issue than it is um, than it is a textual matter. Yeah, a quick quick point there, Dwayne. I just feel anybody who who's not able to check that out should number one be humble right if if you don't know whether a given difference between two translations is textual translational and you don't know how to find out then uh, by definition you're not able to read Greek or mm-hmm. probably Hebrew um, just be humble about that okay and then I've made a tool the KJV parallel Bible online it's totally free where you can go check it out and if you go check out that passage you'll see there's no difference between the critical text and the Textus Receptus tradition. At yeah, this see, I, I would take that a step further, and I would say, go and learn the language, right? All the tools are available, so you can go <laughs> and do that, right? Um, so sure. I, I, that, that's my that's that's where my encouragement would be. Um, so, uh, yeah. So when when if we come back, let me pull up my notes here. Um, I'm using Logos. <laughs> I found the Sermon Manager exceptionally useful, um, so I keep all my like YouTube nice. notes and everything in there. Um, I helped make it a yeah, little bit. Nice. Um, yeah, so so if we take a look at, um, I, and actually Brian Ross, I, I really like Brian Ross. Uh, we, we've been chatting and we've become good friends. So um, he, he did a video on 1 Corinthians one eighteen a while ago, and he kind of did a survey of all of the older translations and how they translated. And basically, everything up to the revised edition had translated uh, this passage as those who are saved as opposed to those who are being saved. 
So I took a look and found the last instance uh, historically where we see it translated as the King James Version is translated. Um, and this comes from the emphatic diglot in 1864. Um, this was put together by a gentleman named Benjamin Wilson. And uh, just as like a, a really interesting historical fact, uh, Benjamin Wilson, though he wasn't a Jehovah Witness, it was thought that some of his strange teachings would find its way into the Jehovah Witness Church. Now, I, I don't say that to lambasin. I just found that as an interesting tidbit of history. But when you take a look at his uh, diglot, he, he translates um, sesos many as those who are saved, not those who are being saved. So this is the last point. And then everything after 1864 seemed to change. Now, one other thing I tried to do was to track down all of the oldest um, uh, Greek grammars uh, that we could find to determine how this mm. was translated. And I really couldn't find anything um, aside from the issue that we tend to have with Greek verbs, which is it's very difficult to distinguish right. between tense, uh, which is, you know, past, present, future, that kind of thing, um, and aspect, which is, you know, it answers the question of what kind of action. Um, so when we apply this to sesos many, um, the tense would be a present tense. It's a present tense par participle for all you Greek nerds out there. Uh, but uh, yeah. it means it's something that is occurring now for the most part. Uh, that There is another portion of that though, which is aspect, which is attached to verbs in Greek, which answers the question right. how that happened. So, so we're answering the question when it happened and how it happened. When it happened is now, how it happened is whether it's something that was a continuous action or maybe it was a one-time event or maybe it was uh, punctiliar, right? It's a series of one-time events, uh, like all these sort of things, right? So, so the question is, is how much does aspect encroach on tense and how much does tense encroach on aspect? And that, my friends, is the big debate that is still raging today. Uh, so... Right. When when I took a look at all the historical uh, grammars, I, I really could not find much of anything aside from it, it's a difficult question. Well, yeah, you know, on that particular question, on aspect, I've read Con Campbell and I've read, uh, it's been mm. a number of years, you know, various grammarians on that. And I came to conclude that the field of experts is not ready to tell us what uh, the the final deliverance is of their of their methods you know the uh, porter fanning debate is famous in this realm uh, and and then as i read through and as i've watched the commentary tradition develop since then i don't feel that that we've really gotten to bedrock no. here and what i've found myself going back to is context yeah. and whenever people make confident judgments about aspect, I, I just end up checking the context. And I find that that's guiding me just fine. Uh, I, I think what it's made me do is back off a little of confident judgments about the relationship between tense and time. Mm -hmm. But context nearly always you know, tells me what to conclude. That's the big thing I think of when it comes to verbal yeah. aspect. Yeah, so I, I lifted um, a note from Dan Wallace. So uh, he, he's kind of like the go-to Greek syntax guy now, right? Like if you go to seminary or anything, you're probably going to be reading his books. And uh, in, in the spot on the, um, I think it was the present tense. I, I think that was the, the, the spot in his book. He, everything's all linked together in his book. It's, it's uh, really wonderful, but it's, it's hard for recalling. But he, he, he doesn't put this in the base text of his, uh, of his uh, work. Uh, instead, it's a small footnote in reference to how aspect and time are related. Right. And, and he says this, um, the more general a referent is, the less the aspect finds place in the present participle. Okay, so what he's saying is that the more general something the verb is talking about, uh, the more its time is indicated to the expensive aspect. At least that's how I would uh, interpret that. Um, but what I'm a little bit less clear on here is what he means by the more general a reference is. I was actually going to email him and, and see if he would answer that. Uh, but I, I'm not entirely certain because the way that I read that, 
um, is when I look at those who are being saved, um, that I, you could almost think that that's fairly general because we're talking about a large group of people, right? Those who are being saved. Um, and right. so the time portion or the tense portion finds less emphasis, according to Dan Wallace, and the uh, aspect, which is the continuous bit, finds more uh, more emphasis, uh, according to Wallace, at least how I am interpreting here. Do you, do you think I'm in- interpreting him properly? Yeah. That's yeah, a difficult phrase, and I would be interested to say what he'd say by email. I would say your interpretation is very much reasonable, yes. The other piece that we often miss, I think, in this discussion is uh, that the verse doesn't, that the phrase, those who are being saved, doesn't doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, so there's a context before it and a context afterward. Uh, afterward. Yeah, so I'll, I'll put this up on the screen there. And, and the whole passage, right? It's for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Um, so contextually, this passage, what it's doing is it's making a comparison between the unsaved and the saved, right? Those who are not saved, right. it's foolishness. Those who are saved, it's the power of God. And of course, um, those who are perishing is the exact same construction as those who are being saved. Um, so there's there's a one-to-one comparison, right. in yeah, Greek. in the Greek, a one-to-one comparison uh, between the two. So as I look at this and as I've been sort of thinking about this, um, the conclusion that I sort of came to in this passage, uh, let me rephrase that, not sort of came to, the conclusion I did come to um, was that Paul isn't necessarily yeah. making a statement about how we come to salvation or how our salvation works out in our lives. He's not He's not talking about that. Um, but what he's doing is he's making a comparison between two groups of people, uh, the one group which is not saved and the one group which is saved. Now, it's interesting because the present participle, uh, I, I think, could also be used to refer to somebody who is in a continuous state of something. I had, I had mentioned this before and somebody said, no, 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 that, that's the perfect tense. That's the perfect tense. Um, but, the, but there is no reference here to anything that has come before it, right? Perfect tense requires a past action that's happened and then present results. But, but there's, no, there's no indication of a, of a past action here. Paul is just talking about specific where we are right now. Yeah. Um, so when, when... Yeah, it's a present. It's not a perfect. It's a present. That's right. So when, when I read this, how... I mean, how you could expansively translate this, at least how I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this, is that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are in a perishing state. Um, but to us who are being, uh, but to us who are in a state of salvation, it is the power of God. That, that, that's kind of where I'm, I'm thinking that. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily talking about um, how we get saved or, or how the process of salvation works, but it's purposely meant to compare those who are on the way to hell and those who are on the way to to heaven. Yeah, so I would say it a little bit differently. You know, in a saved state would need to be contrasting with the first element of the verse, which would then make that mean in a perished state, but they're not. They are perishing. And so that's contextually how I'm reading the second main verb, those who are perishing versus those who are being saved. It's an ongoing mm-hmm. thing. And I know you've done some grammatical forays yeah. here, but I did too. So in Logos, I can search for the word R, and I think you can put this up on the screen for folks, within one word of, of another word that ends in ED, and all of that needs to intersect the, the verb par, uh, present, present verb morphology mm-hmm. in the Greek. That way, I'm looking at parallel constructions yeah. here. That's one of the great values of Bible software. And some of the things I came up with I found very interesting. One is 2 Corinthians, here, where is it? 2 Corinthians 2, 15? I'm sorry, 3.18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit right. of the Lord. The modern translations do tend to go with our being mm-hmm. changed. And isn't that our experience, right? I mean, that's a classic verse about sanctification. Right. In fact, uh, Jim Berg, one of my favorite teachers in college, wrote a book called Changed into His Image, which has recently been put out in a fourth edition by um, uh, PNR. And 
that verb there, it doesn't mean like we've now entered the changed state. Right. That isn't right, the case. Right. We are still being changed. Another thing that I found out was that that construction, our being, which is what you tend to see not only here in 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians one eighteen, our being saved, but elsewhere in places like 2 Corinthians 3.18, yeah, yeah. our being changed. Our being does not occur at all. No, not at all. Zero. And if you look at the way, right, if, if you look at the way are followed by a verb that ends in ed <clears throat> is used in the King James, there are places where you sense, yeah, we could say it that way. Um, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Yeah, we could say that. But there are places where you sense that's just not the way we would say it. I'm uh, something of a real nerd, as you know, and your viewers mm -hmm. might as well, when it comes to word meaning, semantics, in and pragmatics is another aspect of word meaning in the King James, and how language change has affected it. I'll tell you the honest truth. Grammar, I find to be more mm -hmm. difficult. Changes in grammar <clears throat> yeah. over time, I find more difficult to understand and look up. I'm not familiar with those resources as much, but my... My language change alarm most definitely goes off when it when I notice that our being is not used at all in the King James, and it is in, in countless places in modern translations, and that I'm noticing that it's just different the way the King James uses that construction. So I'm sus I'm suspicious that language change is playing a role in the in First Corinthians one eighteen and our current understanding of the way what the King James translation. Yeah, meant. yeah, because I I think I reached out to you on this uh, a while back and you you came back with uh, you weren't entirely sure and it was something maybe you'd look at, and it, it was the question of whether um, our be, um, what is it? let me go back here. It, the question was, as the translation says, which are saved, it is the power of God, but unto us which are saved, is it possible that the construction are saved in 1611 um, used a similar grammatical um, feature that would match our being saved? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I did more looking into that and it to me, it's inconclusive. Right. Um I think based on other things we're saying that that is the case. I'll just give you one sure. more example. Ephesians 2.22, yep. in the King James, it says, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation right. of God through right. the Spirit. I don't think that means that the building has been mm -hmm. built. I think it means it's being right. built. And I don't think the King James translators were uh, ignorant of this. In fact, that would have to be a perfect tense. And, and, you know, in whom ye also have been mm -hmm. built together for an, for an habitation of God through right. the Spirit. Um, for, for, for the, that's the way it sounds to us. Like, that sounds like a perfect tense right. to us. But I think the King James translators could use that for a present. Yeah, because like, like you mentioned, and this is something I noticed as well, is when, when you do a search on the construction, our being, uh, you don't see that at all in the King James. Not once, not a single right. instance of it. Um, so uh, in my mind, that does seem to suggest that there's the possibility that it is, it, it's often used in a place where in, you know, 2024 English, we would say are being saved. Um, so I, I got a couple right. examples here too, which, which sort of work this. So uh, in Matthew chapter 8, 25. Um, this is, you know, Jesus sleeping in the, in the boat and the storm comes and the disciples are all like, Oh, we're going to die. Uh, so they, they wake him up and they get sent his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, uh, Matthew eight twenty five, uh, Lord save us. Uh, we are perishing, right? That that's in the new King James version. Uh, but if you go to the King James version, it says, Lord save us. We perish. Um, so we are perishing is obviously, uh, continuous in aspect. Um, but when you look at the King James Version, it says we perish. Um, you don't see the continuational aspect in that phrase. Uh, and again, it, it's repeated in Luke 8, 24. It's essentially the same story. We are perishing, we perish. And then there's one more interesting passage in Romans 8, 36, um, as is written. Yes. Now, now, the New King James Version follows the King James here. Um, it says, as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. Uh, and the question is like, can you be killed all the day long or like, are you killed and that's it, right? Um, but yeah, for your sake, yeah. we are killed all the day long. Now, the other modern translations, so like the ESV, uh, as you pointed out earlier, uh, says, uh, for your sake, we are killed all the day or we are being killed all the day long. 
and it brings to force that continuous aspect, which I think despite not having the grammatical construction in the New King James or the King James is very clearly uh, has a continuous aspect to it. Um, so yeah, what are your thoughts surrounding I that? I agree. Yeah, I think with a tool like Logos, you can, I'm not here to sell Logos, oh, but um, this is what I use it for, this kind of arcane grammatical searching. <laughs> I mean, it's just really helpful to put, one way of putting this in context is seeing the way that the King James translators handled parallel constructions and see if the confident you know, uh, interpretation that's in those memes is really justified. So another one, Luke seven twenty two. Jesus answering said unto them, go your way, tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. Those two phrases that I emphasized, those are both present tense. And uh, I believe they're, uh, they're passive. So just like Sodzamanois, and I'm using the Erasmian pronunciation here. Yeah, yeah, I don't sure. Care what pronunciation people use? That's just what <laughs> did, I'm used to. Did you to. see my last video? Um, I didn't get to see your last video. Is it about pronunciation? Yes, it is. And I, I basically make fun of everybody who uses okay. Erasmian pronunciation. So <laughs> consider totally you in fine. the made fun of spot. It's. I I accept that completely. I was actually just writing about this. Um, it's just what I'm used to, and I've never sure, bothered to, yeah, yeah. to learn the sure. um, more living language approaches. I really wish I'd had that instead. Ah, oh, well, mm -hmm. the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised. I, I think we sense Jesus, I mean, from context, he's saying there are lepers who progressively throughout my ministry are being cleansed. There are dead people who progressively throughout my ministry are being raised. And mm -hmm. I think if you look at modern translations, you're probably going to see a mix mm -hmm. of whether they, you know, use the present progressive in English or not. Um, but that's a tool that we have that apparently, th that, that is the present progressive, our being. That's a tool that we have in our English that the King James translators apparently did not have in theirs to communicate that ongoing mm -hmm nature of something. So the fact that yeah. they didn't say are being saved doesn't mean that 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 they weren't trying to communicate that. Uh, was that like a quadruple the... negative? That was too many negatives. I I think we got to <laughs> preserve the possibility that that's what they were trying to communicate in 1 Corinthians 1 18, the same there present progressive that the contemporary translations are using. Yeah, no. Now, one thing we didn't really touch on um, is that the, um, the present passive participle um, is also plural. Right, so it's not it's not singular, and uh, if you like touch on any Greek grammarian that they always tell you, or at least uh, Wallace in his books is he's, you know these these words don't exist in a vacuum. They, they these 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 things don't exist that way. Um, so uh, the question then is, does the fact that the present passive participle here is a plural, right, not singular? It's not talking of one person but multiple people. Um, does that change the way we look hmm. at that distinction between uh, tense and uh, uh, an aspect. Um, so that got me thinking a little bit in another potential way to look at this is when he says, um, but to us who are being saved, uh, he's not necessarily referring to an individual and their salvation experience. Um, but rather he's referring to a group of individuals that are in the process of becoming Christians. Um, so in that instance, we go from moving to an aspect which is continuous uh, to an aspect which is punctic uh, pun punticular. <laughs> punticular. I, I'm probably saying that right. <laughs> this, this is what happens when you book smart, right? Yeah, yeah it's okay. punctilier. There we go. Um, so now that's instead true. of looking at a continuous thing that's happening in an individual's life, we're now looking at specific instances in time to a bunch of people. Um, so a, a way to, to address or a way to illustrate this would be, um, you know, ki kids getting on a bus after school, uh, right? Y you're either on the bus or off the bus. It's not like a process of getting on the bus. You, you, you step past the door and you're on. Um, so if you wanted to use, they are being put on the bus. Um, you would be talking about uh, a process where multiple children are being put on the school bus, right? Um, so I, that, that yeah. could be kind yeah. of what we're seeing here. Um, we're talking about multiple individuals who are being saved. So he's not talking just about just about them now at this moment in time, but he's also talking about those who are going to get on the bus, so to speak. 
Um, so that, that I, I found that as another way of, right. of trying to interpret that, that little passage there. Another little point I could just toss in, in Logos, I can just so easily search all my commentaries, yeah. and I've got a couple dozen of them on First Corinthians. I find that I, I, I've been critical, of course, of our King James Only Brothers in this video and in many others, but there's something, well, of course, there's tons and tons of beliefs that we share. And one of the sort of, um, what's the word I want? One of the perspectives on the world that I think we share some is a recognition that if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know, right. that actually tradition does have a value to, to bring to us. Sure. Um, and, and, and I get that societal elites out there are often headed in a very sinful direction and don't always show themselves to be trustworthy. I just think that the King James defenders have, have failed to trust people that really are trustworthy. And I talk about that a good bit on my channel. I, I often use Vern Poitras as an example because I just know him personally. I've emailed with him all the time because I run his website. He's just a very godly man who memorizes scripture all the time and is very faithful to his wife and kids and his grown sons are both serving the Lord. Um, mm -hmm. And he's an ESV translator. Anyway, however, one way that right. you can show that it's not the advent of the critical text and of modern critical perspectives on scripture that has brought us this kind of perspective. Even older commentators like Alexander McLaren <clears throat> made this very point on right. 1 Corinthians 1.18, and I have this in, in Logos. He says, he actually says the revised version, so this he'd be writing at the end of the 19th <clears throat> century uh, and maybe into the beginning of the 20th. He says the revised version brings out the true meaning of these words. Instead of reading them that perish and us which are saved, we ought to read them that are perishing and us which are being saved. That is to say, right. the apostle represents two contrasted conditions, not so much as fixed states, either present or mm -hmm. future, but rather as processes which are going on. So it right. isn't modern liberals and uh, people compromising with the Roman Catholic Church, you know, Protestants who shouldn't be... Uh, uh, put sticking Catholic doctrine in there, which are saying who are saying this. It's people right, who are right. very sensitive to the Greek, including going way back into a time, uh, you know, a long time ago. So I guess this was subsequent to the critical text, <clears throat> and he quotes the revised version. But a person a long time ago that a lot of people today trust was seeing the same thing mm -hmm. that we're saying that we see. All right. So let's. So, so just to kind of to, to conclude, um, I, I guess that it's good to talk about the. Uh, the difficulty surrounding why this is, and we've mentioned it briefly, but one, um, it's that the distinction between time and aspect in the verb is still something that's uh, being worked out today. Um, it, there's an interesting, uh, an interesting conversation surrounding uh, Greek grammar in how how to break uh, nouns up, right, cases. And I recall very early reading about the difference between. Uh, was it the eight case system and the five case system because they were trying to define how yeah. how the cases were being used um, based on function as opposed to form? Um, so it, eventually that came to sort of standardize toward the five case system, right? The nominative, genitive, dative, uh, yeah. accusative, vocative. Uh, mine, you know, we're not talking about right. the ablative or the or the locative or whatever. Right. Um, but that eventually standardized. Uh, to the five K system, and that that's what you read, and it's generally you know assumed across the board that the five K system is good. We, we came to a right. uh, we came to an agreement there, um, but there is that that agreement does not exist when it comes to tr trying to determine the relationship between tense and time. So so that's difficulty with number one, right? That, that's what we wrestle with, um, and then the second one is the nature of language change as time goes on. And as we've talked about right. briefly, um, whether or not the construction, the King James Version is using in English in 1611, um, those who are saved is are saved without the being in the middle. Does that still represent something that could be considered continuous or punctiliar, right? Um, totally possible uh, from some of the examples yeah. that I've seen in my mind. Um, so they could have totally been referencing yeah. that. And then three, right? The, the third one is theologically, um, theologically, whether we're looking at this as a completed action or something that happened in the past or whether we're looking at it as a continuous process. Uh, we know today as Christians that um, there's a sense in which we are 
saved the moment we come to believe. And yet there's another sense in which right. we are being saved in that uh, we are fully saved from our flesh, so to speak, when we make it to heaven on that, that last day, right? Um, so I think that that's right. where I stand with the conclusion on the matter. How about you, Mark? That's where I stand too, Dwayne. And it's really precious to across international lines and across non-denominational yeah. lines, which are important to both of us, you know, we're nonetheless saying we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God so that no one can boast. And we're able to say we are saved, you and I both, because we trust in Christ and in his blood right. alone for salvation. And yet, go ask our wives, are we completely saved, right? Like, <laughs> has the power of sin been entirely eradicated from us? And uh, I don't know your wife, Dwayne, but I feel pretty certain that she would say the same thing my wife has said. And she would just oh, get yeah, big eyes yeah. and say, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, Mark. Well, thank you so much for coming on the channel. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Uh, hopefully we can uh, do this again in the future. Thanks, Dwayne. God bless you. All right, brothers and sisters. I hope you found this discussion helpful. And until next time, we'll see you around.